So yeah, um, I'm going to be speaking about the Lambda architecture. Uh, maybe you've heard about it, maybe you've used it, uh, you might not have. Uh, what I really want to do is to dispel a lot of the, how you say, bullshit around it. Um, because what it really is is that it's based on really old, solid ideas. So things like uh, event sourcing, um, server logs, command query responsibility segregation. But you know, because all these things have kind of been repackaged and rebranded as Lambda architecture, you get you know a lot of this crap, right? So uh, I want to move away from you know a lot of this marketing hype. Uh, and a lot of these uh, kind of like predefined recipes uh, for how you would want to build a Lambda architecture. And I want to move more towards, um, more towards this, because the Lambda architecture is just a blueprint, a template, if you will, uh, for building big data systems. And I would actually argue that it's a template for building any kind of data system. Um, you know, uh, if we go back in time, um, uh, none of us clearly remember this, but in the 1960s, uh, people started building these uh, particle accelerators, and they were discovering all these like random particles that they were, you know, trying to put together into some kind of cohesive framework. And then they discovered uh, the standard model of particle physics, which you know not only was able to describe all of these existing particles that they found, but also predicted new particles that you know they didn't even have the technology at the time to find. And so I'm kind of hoping that. Um, you can look at the Lambda architecture as this kind of standard model of data systems. Maybe that's a bit ambitious, uh, we'll find out. So a few of my goals here, um, you know, this is a conference, so obviously I want to sound really smart. Um, I want to provide you with uh, this practical template for uh, building data systems that fit, uh, fit your business requirements. So I don't want to just give you this exact recipe. Uh, I want you to you know, take this template and then take your business requirements and hopefully be able to build some kind of bespoke system that really fits uh, what you need and what you want. And you know, I also want to show you that a lot of these fancy buzzwords are just things that come from very simple concepts. Uh, I want to break down the Lambda architecture and build it back up from, uh, from real world problems. So let's, let's start with this question. So what is a data system? Uh, so I went on Wikipedia, itself a pretty interesting data system, and I found this. So a data system is a program that collects, stores, and manipulates uh, items of data to provide meaningful information. And so I kind of want to break down this definition a bit, uh, first starting with the verbs. So what a data system does is it collects, it stores, it manipulates, and then it provides or displays. Right. So this is, this is all pretty good, this is important, but I think it's actually the nouns here that are more important because what this definition does is it breaks down uh, the data system into two parts. There's items of data and then meaningful information, right? These two things are actually quite distinct. Like you put data in, that's the input, and then you get meaningful information out, and that itself is a data system. So to just go through a few examples here, uh, you know, a high score table for a game is a data system, right? You collect points from users, you organize them, and then you display those. I'm sure all of us can think of some really nice little SQL queries we can run to, to create this data system. It's pretty simple. Uh, but then we can get more complicated, right? We have a social media news feed where you're collecting users, friendships, posts, you're joining these all together, and then you're ordering them by some kind of function. This is getting pretty complicated. This is pretty big. Uh, and then you can get even more complicated, right? You can have product recommendations for an e-commerce site. You know, you're collecting product purchases, user ratings, user interests. You, know, you might be running some kind of machine learning algorithm on this. It can get, it can get pretty real. Um, but what I want to do is to you know, tie all these systems together. And if you remember back to one minute ago uh, where I described the definition of a data system, uh, it has its input, which is you know, pieces of data, and then its output, which is meaningful information. So maybe we can think of something that takes in inputs and then gives out outputs, right? Maybe, I don't know, a function, right? And so, you know, I think this, this equation kind of really captures what the ideal data system should be. You know, maybe this, you know, you can't always build the ideal thing, but I think this is what we really want to aspire to, right? And so, you know, suppose we have an infinitely fast computer. Let's just imagine that we do. 
Um, this is sort of what we want to build towards, right? Something where, you know, on every request for V, which is our view, uh, we're going to, you know, compute this function F on our, uh, on our data, which should be immutable. So yeah, this is a this is a pretty good system, right? Because uh, you know purity is very good. Uh, there's a lot of nice things about it. So one is you have immutable data, so you never lose information when you delete things, when you change things. You're actually inserting more data in instead of uh, actually removing it. And what this kind of gives you is this this like time machine where you can go back to any particular uh, state of your system and then generate what the system would look like at that particular point in time. So that's pretty nice. Uh, what's also nice is that this makes the system very resilient to errors. Um, because most of the business logic in this you know, very pure model of the world lives in the function, lives in this pure function that you're uh, computing, you're applying to your data. Um, if you screw up that function, all you have to do is just fix the function, right? And then deploy that, and then everything's good, right? Because the view itself, you're not storing, it's ephemeral. It's just this very pure function. And because there's just this pure function where most of your uh, business logic lives, it's very flexible to business requirements. You want more, you want to do more for the business, which means you want more views, then you just write more functions, right? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have infinitely fast computers yet. That's, you know, very aspirational. Uh, so we have a lot of problems with this system. Uh, it's going to be very slow. It's going to be very expensive. So, for example, you know, you have your view getting queried a lot. And we can draw from our example of a high score table. You know, suppose we don't even have a lot of data in there. Suppose this function we have is very simple and we can calculate it very quickly. Well, suppose we just get a lot of requests for it, right? Suppose we're talking about, I don't know, StarCraft, right? And you have your professional StarCraft players who are actually playing the game. But then we're like in South Korea where, you know, the entire population is, cares about StarCraft. So they're always querying it. Uh, I mean, that's still going to slow your system to a crawl, even if you don't have a lot of data in the system, and even if you don't have uh, a very expensive function. So that's a big problem. But another problem is if you do have a lot of data, right, and we can draw on our social media example, uh, we have tons of users, we have even more friendship relationships between the users, and we have a ton of posts that all of these users are doing. And what makes it even worse is that we actually have to calculate the Cartesian product of these, uh, to get our news feed, and we then have to sort it, right? So we're massage, we're running through a lot of data, and of course we can have a very expensive function, right? Our business logic can be complicated. Uh, we can take our e-commerce example, you know, that's you could do a lot of things with that, right? And sometimes you actually have to pull in uh, in a lot of machine al uh, learning algorithms, you actually have to pull in the, like the global set of data. You can't run things piecemeal, so this is uh, this is pretty bad. But there's, there's actually a pretty straightforward way of solving this problem, right? I mean, how do you solve any problem that uh, involves repeated and expensive computations? You use caching, right? Caching or memoization. Um, and I'm sure I don't need to remind anyone here what caching is. I'm just going to go through and talk about the different types of caching that are possible. So the first is uh, right-side caching, right? So this is when... Uh, as you make changes to the data, you're also mutating the cache in some way. So for our high score table example, if we, you know, player scores a point, we write out uh, points to our data, uh, and then we also mutate some kind of counter that represents our high score table, right? So that's, that's right side caching. And I would argue that any kind of mutation that you do to a data system, like any kind of stuff you would do right now that you, know, you wouldn't really label as immutable, uh, it's kind of just a, a, a type of right-side caching. So, you know, I just gave the counter example where as you insert, you also mutate a counter. Uh, something a bit more counterintuitive is suppose you have, you know, a post table. Let's suppose you're Facebook, right? And a user goes back and is like, oh, this post was really stupid and embarrassing, so I'm going to edit it. Um, updating that post is actually not really changing the data. You're actually changing the view, right? In this kind of system where you just have you know, a SQL table with all your posts in it, you don't actually have data. You just have the view into the data. So whenever you change the post, you're actually throwing away data. You're just mutating this view onto that data, this cache. Um, and so 
you know, the way I put it, you can kind of follow that there's going to be a lot of flaws in this, uh, in this kind of uh, caching. Right? Uh, it's mutable, which means mistakes can be made. Uh, and when you do make a mistake, uh, the truth can be hard to recover. Right? The computation that produced the truth might be really expensive. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, you just lose the data. You might not be able to recover it. Right? Like in the case of you know, if you just do an update on a row, well, you know, the, old, the old version of that is probably just gone. Uh, the other type of caching is read-side caching. I'm sure you guys have used this before. Um, so basically what, what happens is, you know, you want to get something from the database. Uh, so the first time you want to do that, you, you actually do that. You run the query. And when you get back the results, then you cache it so that the next time uh, you, want, you want this data, you don't have to call the database. Something like that. Right. So this doesn't have any direct applications for the Lambda architecture um, for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, the computations you're doing might still be really expensive, right? Like suppose, you know, I want to calculate a news feed for this user, so I do this insanely long, expensive computation, and then, you know, well, the user might not actually want to get that again, right? The only benefit I get from this is if the user comes back and tries to get that data again. And moreover, a lot of the raw data that you have might not be in a position to be accessed. Could be in a situation like uh, S3, or HDFS or something like that where you can't just, you know, it's very difficult to just read that uh, on the fly. So instead of doing read side caching, we want to accomplish the same kind of things um, but in a more reasonable way. And so we have this concept of batch caching. Uh, so with batch caching, what you're doing is you're pre-computing all of the views, right? So, you know, at time t, God comes down and he's like, let there be views and we get all the views, right? And so it's pretty obvious that this is insanely slow, right? This, the, you're computing the entire universe. Um, but it's good because it's, uh, it's, you know, horizontally scalable, right? So you can break down this computation into your individual pieces of data, and you can basically scale arbitrarily, uh, in an arbitrarily large way, horizontally. And it's also safer because every time you do this, you are recomputing the world, right? So this is actually really nice. We want to... We want to do this is probably as close as we're going to get to that pure function we were talking about before. So batch is really great. What the Lambda architecture is, and you know, we're finally getting to it, um, is just a combination of these caching methods. You know, it's, it's nothing special. Uh, it specifically combines the batch side caching and write caching. Maybe you could incorporate read caching into it. I don't know. Maybe that's possible. But uh, it does it in a way that emphasizes the strengths of these particular caching methods uh, and then minimizes the weaknesses. And we want to get as close as we can to that ideal universe where we have you know, infinitely fast computers and we can really just do purely V equals FD. So let's go, let's go into the boxes world here. Um, this is the batch side. So you have this, this box. Uh, this is our source of data. Uh, and it's feeding data into our master data set. So this would be something like HDFS or S3, whatever you really want. Uh, you feed it in, and then you, you run a batch computation on that every once in a while, right? And then that feeds data into your serving layer, which is where you can serve the data. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys have seen this and have used this in your pipelines. This is like a very classic big data pipeline. Uh, what's Unusual about the Lambda architecture is that we're also going to layer on this extra speed layer, um, which is actually very ill-defined, right? Because the speed layer deals with a lot less data, you can do some weird stuff with it, right? And it's only dealing with new data, generally. Uh, you have a lot of flexibility here uh, because you're operating on a much smaller data set. You can use different technologies. You can do streaming if you want to, but you don't really even have to. You can just put data into, like, I mean, honestly, you might even be able to put data into like a SQL database here, right? That could be your speed layer. Um, and another thing that sometimes gets brought up uh, with Lambda architecture is that the speed layer actually can be really inaccurate. It can be inaccurate, and you still kind of get a reasonable estimate of what you want to see, and that's fine. You don't have to do it that way, but you can. So at the end, um, we have these two different sides, the, the batch and serving layer and the speed layer. Well, we want to take, uh, take data from our serving and speed layer in an API request, and we want to combine it together uh, at some time. 
so this is really nice because it not only uh, allows you to deal with two different types of caching, it also allows you to partition your technologies, right? So you no longer have to search for this magic bullet database that does everything well. You can just have, you know, some crappy old database for your speed layer. I mean, it shouldn't be crappy, but it should do what you want it to do really well. It doesn't have to do anything else really well. So another good way of, uh, of visualizing the Lambda architecture, this is the way I prefer, is using a timeline. Right? So you know, suppose we start with nothing, and our first batch job finishes. Right? We fast forward time to this point where our first batch job finishes. We have a view, finally, uh, and this is all good. But time has you know, a tendency to continue going so we, you know, we keep going, and all of a sudden our data is stale by maybe a couple of hours. This sucks. So what we do is we use our speed layer to keep us up to date. Right? It's, just, it's just filling up here. And as time continues, you know, our speed layer gets larger and larger. We actually don't want it to get too large, right? because that's not what the speed layer is for. We want it to keep it at a reasonable size. And we do that. We do that by defining a partition or a boundary between the speed and the batch layer so that anything older than that boundary on the speed layer we can just toss out. And this is nice because then, bam, you know, the, the second batch job finishes, wipes out all the old speed views, and that's totally fine. And I also want to note that this is not like a supplemental thing to batch job one. This, the batch job two provides views for, you know, for all of that time. So it's actually wiping out everything. And this is really nice because you know any kind of human error that we encountered before is fixed, right? So if you made a mistake in batch job one, fixed it by the time batch top job two kicks off, well then you know you're you're good to go. Uh, if your speed layer had some kind of problem, well you could you know you can turn off your speed layer, and you know just deal with your stale data, make that fixed, and by the time batch job two finishes, it's gonna it's gonna have good data up to that point, right? So this is kind of a very self-repairing system. So, um, so now that you have a good grasp of what the Lambda architecture is like from a theoretical standpoint, uh, let's kind of take a look at a few examples of it so that you can kind of see uh, how, the, how the different kinds of ways to do it. And I'm actually going to dive into some, uh, how do you say, degenerate Lambda architectures which you know, incorporate either uh, only just the speed layer or just the batch layer and see like, why you would make these kinds of decisions. So the first is, you know, the Nathan Mars Lambda architecture. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, right? It, you dump data into HDFS, that's your master data set. You process it using Casca log, and then dump that into ElephantDB. Uh, I've never used ElephantDB, but, you know, this Nathan Mars is a smart guy. He stands by it. Um, and so that's your, your batch layer. On the speed layer, uh, you dump data into uh, queues, which are processed by st uh, storm topologies. And these topologies dump data into HBase, which serves as the speed layer database. Then when you're ready, you, take, uh, you query both the Elephant DB side and the HBase side, combine those results together, and you can get exactly what you want. So um, before Will, uh, I worked at Clout. And uh, one of my last projects is at Clout was to rebuild uh, our data pipelines so that they could support real-time views. So you know, I read. Uh, all the things that Nathan Mars wrote, I really liked it, but I didn't want to do this because that involved a lot of changes. Uh, we we didn't have Casca log set up, we didn't have Elephant DB, and probably didn't really want to use it because it's not fully mature. Um, we had HBase set up, but we didn't really want to deal with a lot of storm and stuff like that. So instead, I built something like this, right? So we already have uh, HDFS for a master data set. Uh, we already have Hive to process that data, and we already had HBase, so you know that batch side is, was already built for us. Uh, on the speed layer, we we had Elasticsearch set up, um, and what I was thinking, uh, my thinking, on that side was, instead of dealing with all these weird storm topologies, and so that every time you had to create a new view, you had to do a lot of work. Uh, let's let's reduce that uh, because the data we're dealing with here on the uh, speed layer is actually pretty small. It's not only uh, constrained by time, uh, much like this presentation. Um, it's also constrained by you know we don't even care about all of our users. We only care about active users. Only active users need to see real time data. So we can try to keep that data really really small and just push you know, the raw, almost raw data into Elasticsearch and then do more computation on the read side. 
right? So it's every time you want to develop a new feature on it, well, you can just write an Elasticsearch query and you're good to go. Instead of needing to like set up all this, all these you know storm spouts and drains and other water things. Um, and that kind of goes into um, the old pipeline. So before we added the real-time components, uh, all we had just you know HDFS, batch jobs in Hive going into HBase. Um, this might look kind of janky, but like, why would you do anything else with this, right? If you think about the cloud score, uh, it's not something that changes very often, right? It might go up one point at a time per day. So it's really not a big deal. It's not very useful to have real-time data for just the score. And that's what the old pipeline was built for. So, you know, even, so in, this is a Lambda architecture, but it's just one side of it, right? And this is the stuff you will want to consider when building out uh, whatever data system you choose to build. Uh, and likewise, you know, suppose at some new startup, maybe named Will, uh, we don't even we don't even care about the batch side. We don't have to deal with that much data, right? We can kind of get away with very quickly building out these you know these speed views on something, say like Postgres, um, and just run with that. And actually, even in larger um, in larger uh, data situations, you can do this too. And in fact, I think this is kind of what the Kappa architecture uh, is built on. So the Kappa architecture is something. Um, is similar to the Lambda architecture, but it's just uh, consuming things from a stream. And the idea is that you don't really need the batch side. Instead, you can just reprocess uh, old stream data and just spin up more workers. And so this is actually, a, you know, just a very much a speed view, um, a speed view architecture. So just to summarize, um, Lambda architecture it combines. Uh, just two types of caching, right? That's all it really is. It's an elegant use of caching. It combines batch side caching where you're recomputing the whole universe and then pushing that out somewhere, as well as right side caching where every time you make a change to your data, you're changing your cache. So it combines these two techniques. Uh, this allows you to partition your technologies and specifically on the speed, uh, the speed side, you can use interesting technologies to get whatever you want. The batch side is a bit more prescribed. I really wouldn't would screw with it. Um, however, yeah, exact, you still need to design your data system. Like you can't just take the, these things as recipes and then just say, okay, I'm done. Right? You, have to, you have to think about your business requirements, think about what kind of trade-offs you want to make. Um, but this is a pretty nice template for you to, uh, to think on. So that's that. Um, you can contact me in various ways, um, but don't be a recruiter. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jaron. Thank you. I think we're just about, uh, maybe we could do one really quick question. Thanks. Uh, so how much more complicated was your code base compared to having a more typical architecture in terms of like code replication and the addition of the, the, com the combining layer? The combining layer, uh, the combining layer, I would say, is uh, is definitely the the mo it can get the most complicated. Um, there's a uh, the combination of these two things will depend a lot on business logic. Uh, the the nice thing about uh, our thing was that it was easy to de deduplicate things uh, because what we wanted to combine were you know views like all the users' posts, um, aggregate data. So there's actually because these are very time based, there's like a delineation between them, and you can take advantage of that. Uh, there's a lot of things, um, I don't know, recommendations would probably be pretty hard to do. Um, it would be hard to build this kind of partitioning thing for. All right. Thank you.